Thank you. So I actually get to be a little bit of the light at the end of this tunnel because it turns out that we now have some great new therapies emerging, a lot of which has come because of the basic and translational science that we now understand about the disease. Um, I generally treat and research patients who have AERD, so aspirin or NSAID exacerbated respiratory disease that have the triad of asthma, usually adult onset, severe, severe and recurrent nasal polyps, and um, aspirin and NSAID sensitivity. And so the fact that we've had so few um, tools in our toolkit has been a big problem for our patients, and we are very much looking forward to having some more options. So this is a slide that I think um, Dr. Hopkins went through as well. Um, and just to remind us that what we see in the clinic, what's my... Um, the symptoms of the mucosal elk growths that become nasal polyps, the um, mucus hypersecretion that becomes nasal blockage and congestion and nasal discharge and eventually loss of smell, all of that comes from the inflammatory milieu that we're seeing in the respiratory tract, both in the sinuses and certainly in the lungs as well. So to dive into that a little bit further, it turns out really that you know, this type two inflammatory response that we blame on the polyps, we blame for the polyps, we're right to blame it, but we have to take a step back and notice that it's actually a, a normal immune response to maintain the barrier integrity of our mucosa. It's only when it becomes um, hypercyclical and continues unabated that we end up with a disease pathology. And so what Dr. Buckhart mentioned is the release of the epithelial cytokines, the innate cytokines that we, um, uh, TSLP, IL-33, IL-25 that are released. Those from the epithelium and from other cells then act on the effector cells. ILC2s have gotten a lot of press lately, but we also have effector T cells, basophils, eosinophils, mast cells, and B cells as well that end up then producing um, antibodies and further inflammation, including those canonical cytokines, IL-4, five and 13. Um, so specifically in terms of the um, uh, cytokines, there is n literally a new data emerging every day about what they do and what blocking them might do for us. Um, just to give you a general overview and summary for each one, IL-4 is probably best known for increasing the IgE receptor on mast cells, dendritic cells, and basophils. It's also um, very important for um, pushing B cells to be IgE producing cells. Um, it also drives other effector cells to overproduce cytokines to allow for other granulocyte, things like eosinophil activation and recruitment. IL-5 is probably currently best known as being an eosinophil survival and maturation factor, and it allows the eosinophils to then be recruited into the tissue. But it actually was first discovered um, and described as a B cell maturation and, and survival factor. So it plays an important role in adaptive immunity as well. And IL-13 is very important in mucus um, uh, cell production and mucus hyperplasia. And the combination of IL-4 and IL-13 together can end up decreasing tight junctions in epithelial cells and really allowing the barrier dysfunction that we see in this disease. So I'm gonna go through briefly in the next few slides the agents that we now have that are aiming to block somewhere and interrupt somewhere in this inflammatory pathway. Omalizumab, which is anti-IgE. Mepolizumab, which is anti-IL-5. Dupilumab, which is anti-IL-413 because it blocks the IL-4 receptor alpha, which is a shared receptor for IL-4 and IL-13. And then dexpromethexol, which it's likely that none of you have heard of. Um, it's actually an anti-eosinophil agent, a novel small molecule that was used in a small pilot trial um, in a phase two. And I'm throwing it in here because the results were so surprising to me that I think it might actually change the dogma of how we talk about eosinophilic nasal polyps. So omalizumab, which I'm starting with just because it's the oldest one we've had available for prescribing. Um, it, this is a trial of 24 patients, um, 16 on drug, eight on placebo for 16 weeks. And here the primary endpoint of the trial was for patients coming in with a nasal polyp scoring system. They then were looking for a decrease in nasal polyp score. That rhinoscopic scoring system goes through a maximum of four on each side or maximum of eight bilaterally. And they found um, a decrease of 2.6 from um, from baseline, and if you remember back to this slide that was shown earlier of what steroids can do, systemic steroids, which are sort of our baseline of what we hope for. In fact, this is right about where steroids got us. So that was a pretty significant reduction. They also found significant improvements in smell scores, nasal congestion scores, and runny nose. And the truth is, we don't actually know whether or not this is the right amount of nasal polyp score to reduce. We like a quantifiable number. 
the regulatory agency is really like a quantifiable number. But our patients care much more about smell, nasal congestion, and runny nose. We don't yet have really good data to tell you that what a clinically significant decrease in nasal polyp score is. So the best that we can do is tell you that in parallel with the change in score, we also had improvements in symptoms. So mepolizumab, and this is the largest study published to date, 105 um, polyp, um, patients, about half went on mepolizumab IV, um, and about half stayed on placebo. And their primary outcome actually was a little bit different than just the nasal polyp score. In order to, I think, get around that problem of what is a clinically relevant or a clinically significant reduction in nasal polyp burden, they created a composite end score that involved both the total polyp score and also a visual analog scale of severity of burden. And they deemed that all incoming patients required surgery, sort of were bad enough to warrant surgery. And then after this, the, the treatments determined how many of those patients no longer met that criteria. Turns out that about 90% of the placebo patients still met and only 70% of the mepolizumab patients met it. So they had improvement in 20 to 30% of patients. They also had um, a decrease in total polyp score of about one and a half to two. And it turns out that about 50% of the patients had a decrease in, a in the polyp score of at least one. So by that measure, it's about a 50% responder rate. Again, those symptoms that our patients care about, um, decrease in runny nose, rhinorrhea, decrease in the mucus congestion in the back of the throat, decrease in congestion, and decrease uh, improvement in sense of smell. They also had a 13-point improvement in the SNOT22 score over placebo. SNOT22 is the sinonasal outcome test. It asks 22 questions of our patients. It's a quality of life and upper respiratory and lower respiratory questionnaire. Um, it's determined that sort of a change of eight or nine is significant. So 13 was significant here. Now, interestingly, Although these patients are, we, we had discussed mepolizumab as being an anti-IL-5 and therefore being anti-eosinophil. With only 50% of the patients truly responding by total polyp score, they cleverly went back and did an ad hoc um, reanalysis to determine if they could have preferentially known whether or not you would have responded to it. And it turns out that by blood eosinophil level, the answer was no. There was really no difference between the baseline blood eosinophil patients, um, blood eosinophils of the patients who did and did not respond to mepolizumab, which leads us to wonder, what is the IL-5 doing if it isn't just acting at the systemic eosinophil numbers? So dupilumab, which is the antibody against the IL-4 receptor alpha, blocks the signaling of both IL-4 and IL-13. So this is a trial of 60 patients. Again, patients on placebo and patients on subcutaneous um, dupilumab over 16 weeks. Their primary outcome was, again, that total polyp score. And they got a 1.9, um, so almost two points of improvement after the 16 weeks of the trial. They, and, and really, if you look backwards at it, um, that improvement began quite dramatically by their first um, time point they looked at at week four. Again what's important to our patients. So this is the SNOT22 score difference. This was really a whopping improvement in SNOT22. This is actually probably the largest I've seen in terms of the questionnaire improvement in quality of life from our patients. And here's a smell test, not just asking the question, can you or can you not smell? This is actually, the Ipset smell test is quite literally scratch and sniff booklets of 40 different smells. And then the patients are offered a multiple choice of four that they can choose. If you can smell correctly between 35 and 40, that's considered to be normal. The patients who came in, almost all of them were in the less than half, so hyposmia or complete anosmia. So here, what they ended up with, notice there was absolutely no placebo effect on smell. Um, what they ended up with was 14 increased numbers, actual more things that you could smell, which for most of these patients doubled the number of things they could smell and got them into the normal range, which is a huge improvement for these patients. All three of those drugs are now in phase three trials for nasal polyps, so we will get more information from them. Okay, so this is the funkier one. Dexpromipexol is a orally bioavailable small molecule that was somewhat serendipitously found to dramatically and quickly reduce blood eosinophils. And so a phase two trial, a small open label pilot was begun for eosinophilic nasal polyps. And they were hoping that that blood lowering effect would somehow be paralleled with an eosinophil tissue lowering effect. And so here was the blood lowering effect. So after month six, we were really down to essentially none, starting from relative eosinophilia. And in fact, although the month, month six was the dramatic um, point, almost complete 
blood depletion of eosinophils was noted by month two. It turns out that was true in the polyps as well. And so they had biopsies at, at baseline and biopsies at month six, and there was a magnificent fall in, in, in the tissue eosinophils. I looked at these biopsies myself, and seeing um, a, a biopsy go from 570 per high-powered field to four eosinophils per high-powered field is a very cool thing to see. So the drug worked, except that it didn't. So the drug worked to deplete eosinophils, but the patients didn't get better. Their total polyp score, that rhinoscopic viewing of the polyps that you guys see, didn't change. The polyp symptoms didn't change. Sense of smell did not improve. SNOT22 did not improve. The CAT scan Lumma chi score of volume did not improve. So it turns out that although we refer to these all as eosinophilic nasal polyps, we have for decades been not only blaming the eosinophil for causing our problem, but been madly developing drugs to fight against the eosinophil, you can now get rid of all of the eosinophils, I mean really all of them in a nasal polyp, and not make the patient better. So I put this out here because this is new, we're publishing it shortly, and we don't yet quite know what to make of it. I do suspect that it will change the dogma of what we try to target and what we try to aim for. Now, is it possible that eosinophil influx is a driving and inciting factor for the polyps? Could be. Is it po possible that for those very recurrent and quickly recurrent patients after surgery, especially my AERD patients, that the eosinophil influx is what's inciting their regrowth? It could be. That was not how this trial was designed. So I can't talk about that. But I can tell you that the size and polyp burden is not affected by the removal of eosinophils. It also then suggests that as we move forward for targets, and no, the company is no longer moving forward with nasal polyps for this drug, that perhaps we should start um, thinking about those broader areas of inflammation. So the, the um, upstream pathways, the innate cytokines, IL-33, TSLP, IL-25, and the downstream broader pathways that might hit more than one cell or more than one cytokine. So you know, here's a lovely you know, viewpoint of the entire inflammatory pathway that is, is involved in nasal polyp continuation and nasal polyp growth. The eosinophil is certainly there, I mean, in many patients, it makes up 50% of all of the white blood cells in the nasal polyp. And yet it's only one cell in the grand pathway. And so I think targeting areas that are gonna be broader or upstream are more likely to have success for us going forward. Thank you.